Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the meeting, the regular meeting of council for uh, April the twelfth. And this is our one hundred and forty second annual council meeting. So the first thing we have on the agenda is there's a public hearing, and it's to consider a development agreement application to enable a sawmill at thirty. 333 Highway 335 in Pubnico. So we have, uh, where is he? He's here. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> we have Reed Shepard with us from WSP and he's going to take us through. So you're on, Reed. Great. Thank you, Warren. I'll just share my screen here so everyone can uh, follow along. Okay, so that should be showing up okay. All right, um, <clears throat> so uh, this is an application for uh, a development agreement and that development agreement is for um, proposed uh, sawmill use. And that's located uh, at 333, Highway 335. So this, um, this image here shows a, a layout of, of the property and um, the, uh, the applicant in this case has already set up the, the sawmill. And so uh, that what they're doing now is, is looking for just to clear up some of the, the, the permissions that are, that are needed prior to doing that. And so they've kind of done some applications with the municipality. Uh, so that's why we're kind of seeing this stuff um, already set up. <clears throat> so we can see by the diagram here is there's two uh, two buildings, a larger building and a smaller one. The, the larger one has the, the sawmill in it, and then the other one it, uh, is more of a storage uh, shed. <clears throat> uh, the property is currently zoned coastal community, and um, other than these new uh, structures, uh, the, the lot is, is, is largely vacant. Um, it's uh, just over eight acres, and the proposal here would be um, the development agreement would cover the entire <clears throat> property itself and it has about 230 feet of frontage along 335. So this is taken from uh, Google and you can see uh, to the right there's a bit of an entrance to the to the lot. Um, I believe this was 2020 or 2021 so it's fairly recent from Google but you can see that um, as of this image that the, the owner had put in the driveway access. So you can tell kind of where, where the access goes into the, into the lot. This is a, just a bit of a higher level uh, view. And um, so just in terms of surrounding uses, you do have a couple of uh, houses that are other side of, of, of the highway. Um, to the north and south, you have some kind of light industrial commercial type of uses. Um, which is which is kind of characteristic of the area. It's uh, with that coastal community zone. We have a kind of, quite a kind of wide variety of uh, light industrial, commercial, uh, residential, and other kinds of rural uses. And so, as I mentioned, uh, the the buildings are already in place here. They're not, um, you know, they're not substantial, um, at, you know, at least for right now in terms of you know, servicing and other elements. Um, but you can see that there is that, uh, the sawmill set up in, in the larger building there, it's, it's open to the outside. Uh, the smaller kind of accessory uh, structure at the bottom left. And then uh, as a part of this, the, the owner also um, does some firewood processing kind of as a secondary uh, part of the, the operation as well. And so that's what we see with the, um, with the machine and, and the uh, the trailer there as well. Just another shot. So this would be kind of looking in at the site from the road and uh, you can see they've got some wood piled and the area that's cleared. So the lot's actually quite a lot larger than this cleared area, but um, it gives you a sense of how it looks from the road. So in terms of the what the application involves here, it's a, it's a development agreement. Um, and that's because the coastal community zone um, does permit sawmills as a permitted use, but it requires that, that those uses um, be permitted only through a development agreement application process. 
And so that's why uh, this development application uh, has been applied for. <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned, it's its, its own coastal community. So uh, because of that, the, app the applicant uh, applied for the development agreement. So in terms of um, the, the property location along 335, um, the the kind of CC that's in uh, in the beige area. So that's kind of designating, showing us where uh, all the areas that are zoned coastal community are. So it, basically the whole surrounding area with a few exceptions have that same zone. So it's, uh, you know, it's fairly similar to the other areas around here. So when an application comes in for a development agreement, um, what we have to do is kind of look at what the policies are in the municipal planning strategy. And there are some um, kind of uh, requirements that must be looked at when, when you're evaluating a development application or a development agreement application. So the staff report kind of outlined there an, an evaluation and, and whether it met um, what those policies require. Um, there are, as I mentioned, the policies in the municipal planning strategy do, do say that within the coastal community zone, um, you can have a sawmill use uh, as long as it goes through a development agreement, uh, but there would not be a requirement to amend the municipal planning strategy as well. So there is that enabling policy that we also look for there. So why is amendment necessary? I've already kind of mentioned, but basically it's, uh, it's not a permitted use as of right, but it is permitted through a development agreement. And so looking at what the kind of uh, planning policies are about, you know, what is the, uh, what's the idea around the coastal community zone and the designation? Um, it, it's, it's a rural area. Uh, so it's intended to accommodate growth and development that's similar to the rural centers, but um, there are other types of uses that, that are seen in the coastal community zone um, that they're a little bit more um, broad and flexible. Uh, just because of the rural nature of the area. So we're talking about residential, institutional, commercial, light industrial, recreational, um, and then some of those, a few uses that, that are permitted, but uh, by way of a development agreement only. And so kind of looking at what, what the surrounding area, uh, it's, 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 in fit, it's kind of in keeping with the types of uses, like those light industrial uses to the, the north and south. Uh, and, and especially on the scale of the operation, it's fairly small as well um, and so there's a there is a development agreement that's drafted and some of the requirements in that agreement um, outline a, a 30 meter setback from nearby residential uses so the what the diagram shows there uh, from what the application what the applicant submitted uh, shows that you know those houses across the across the road are um, are at least 100 feet or 30 meters from you know where the sawmill is located currently but what this agreement would would do would be just make sure that it there's not new uh, equipment and things like that that are get even closer to those houses. Um, there's also a requirement there to maintain the vegetation that's that's along the road, uh, so that it's you know visually it's not uh, it's not um, as noticeable. Um, the agreement also, which is similar to most of the development agreements, just requires that the the premises be kind of tidy and 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 kept up. Um, and then uh, there's also a clause in there, which again is similar to other agreements where there's a limit on, or there's a requirement that no noise, dust, or odors that would cause an unreasonable nuisance to adjacent properties. Um, and so what, the, what this does is gives the development officer, development officer um, the authority to uh, revoke this um, agreement if the uh, owner of the property uh, is in violation of any of those requirements. So it just gives the municipality a bit more control um, over the future. And if the applicant is looking to do something like expand and, and things like that, that's fine. They just need to be going through and, and, uh, and looking at the agreement again and making any adjustments there and making sure that, uh, again, we're not getting you know, closer to those residential uses or, or doing anything that would cause um, substantial amount of noise and dust, you know, on those people in particular. So in terms of public engagement, um, we had that previous uh, council meeting where this was kind of at, went to a first reading. Um, and then after that, so there were some specific requirements under the Municipal Government Act, um, such as an advertisement uh, in the newspaper, 
in a sign that was put on the on the property, and then there was a notice that went out to um, property owners uh, in the in the vicinity of the of the property. And so, to date, uh, there hasn't been any correspondence received in relation to the application. Um, and then, uh, lastly, kind of what are the next steps here? So the staff, we've, we've reviewed this, we've completed that and made a recommendation and the recommendation is for approval. Um, we didn't receive any written feedback from, uh, from anyone about this. Um, there's the standard kind of right of, a, of appeal option or um, opportunities for the applicant or any aggrieved person to appeal a decision. Um, and then there's a, there would be a, a notice published, um, which would then be followed by a 14 day appeal period. Uh, so right now we're at the public hearing stage and then uh, later this evening, council has the opportunity to um, pass, uh, pass a motion for kind of final approval of this as well. So my last slide here is just that, uh, again, the recommendation is for um, council to give second reading and, and approve the application uh, for this particular use. So that concludes the presentation uh, for this and I will um, kind of just wrap it up there, but uh, of course, happy to answer questions as well. And I'll just stop sharing my screen here. Any questions, anybody? Don't see anybody. I guess it's pretty straightforward. And uh, there, if there hasn't been anybody register for, for this, it kind of shows that either they're satisfied or they, or they didn't know one, one, one or the other. But OK, so if there's no questions, do we? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Dantramo, I didn't see your hand. Um, just a question. So I, I take it that the adjacent landowners, uh, uh, property owners, were were notified by a letter, or how does that work? Yeah, the requirement is so that anybody within 152 meters, so uh, um, your GIS uh, person can can basically draw a line, just making sure that all the people there are captured, and then it's a standard letter that would go out to those folks, okay. and then and then of course the sign on the property as well. Great, thank you. Now, I just, one thing I'll mention too, I, I myself uh, yesterday, and then I, I believe Scott also, we spoke with the property owner and um, he wasn't able to attend the meeting, uh, but I believe that he was gonna listen in uh, to the to the live stream, just to, to make sure things go. Okay. Okay. Hmm. If there's no other questions, do we, we don't make a motion here, right? We, Correct. No, this is just this. We just bring the recommendation to the meeting, yep. and the recommendation is for acceptance. That's correct. Okay. Well, if there's no questions. I guess that that ends the uh, public hearing. And I thank you, Reed. Hey, thank you, everyone. Yep. Okay. So. We'll call the, the uh, 142nd Annual Council meeting to order. You all have an agenda. Anybody have anything to add or? Seeing none, we need an, a motion to approve the agenda. Moved move by Councilor Donaldson, seconded by Deputy Warden Albright. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded. Okay. Carried. Uh, conflict of interest uh, declaration. Anybody have any conflict of interest to declare? And if, if we come to an item, you can always declare it during the meeting. Next item is a presentation, which we don't have. And option of minutes, we have special council meeting of March the 24th. Moved by Councillor Stratt, seconded by Councillor Bork. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. 
That joins Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes of March of 29. Moved by Councillor Dottermore, seconded by Councillor Bork. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Country minded, carried. Um, business arising, letter of support sent to Hope Dialeride. That, that's been done. I signed a letter and that was sent. And we have letter of support sent to Wedgeport Wind Farm. And that has been uh, looked after as well. The next is the appointment of auditors. So right now we have uh, Grant Thornton as our auditors. And I guess it's up to uh, council whether we stay with the same or if we or if we go elsewhere and shop around or whatever. So there's a motion there. If anybody wants to make a motion or discuss, Councillor Bork, is that a question or no, that's a motion. And that's a motion to approve the firm of Grant Thornton as auditors of the municipality of Argyle for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Is there a second there? Seconded by Deputy Warden. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Next one appointment of solicitors. Council to approve the solicitors for the April 1st. We've had uh, the firm of Dr. Mo Boudreaux solicitors. So, Councillor Surrett, that's a motion. And Councillor Dartmoor, second. So moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councillor Digden. I'm wrong again. They're on that Zoom. It's got me. I'm supporting <laughs> it 100%. <laughs> okay. So all in favor, simplify by saying that by uh, raising your hand. Contrary minded. Carried. The next one is appointment of officers. And the officers that we have, the following list of officers, we have fire wards, which are the chief and deputy chiefs of all the nine fire departments of the municipality or serving the municipality through mutual aid. Remo coordinator, we don't right now, but that position has been, that position has been uh, uh, posted. Remo assistant coordinator, we had Max Stolberger. Building official, Rene Jedry and John Sullivan. Development officer, John Sullivan and Rene. Bylaw, bylaw enforcement officer, Mitch Colburn. And fire inspector is Mitch Colburn. And dog control is the SPCA. So the motion will would accept uh, all of them in one motion. So are there any discussions or is someone prepared to make the motion? M moved by Councillor Dickton, seconded by Councillor Bork. So the council approves the enclosed list of appointments appointments as officers of the municipality of Argonne. So all in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Next one. Members of NSFM and FCM. We have to do this every year as membership. We're members of both uh, organizations, Nova Scotia of Federation and the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So we need a motion. Did someone raise their hand? Motion to approve the membership. Oh, okay, <laughs> just <laughs> Councillor Saunier, seconded by Council by Deputy Warden. CAO, go ahead. You had your hand raised. <laughs> it it was kind of like more past tense, Mr. Chair, but uh, I appreciate the efficiency that you're going through the list. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that uh, Mitch Colburn is officially uh, certified to be our bylaw enforcement officer that's done through the Department of Justice. So 
Um, you may have had some dealings with Mitch uh, uh, with certain you know, bylaw infractions or questions. Uh, so he is officially that person. He is not officially a fire inspector uh, in accordance with the certification of the province, but that is, uh, that's his plan and, and he's working towards that. The other person was uh, Renee Jedry. Renee recently received a uh, successful uh, uh, certification for what, I, what we call residential. So he can sign off on about 70% on about of our building official documents right now. Um, so at about six months from last week, he'll probably get the level one certificate, which would bring his percentage from 70 to like 98%. Uh, I would, would leave like level two complex buildings, et cetera. So, these people are, have been designated by you uh, as official, as officers, but I just want to make sure that you understood that this, of the certification that happens behind that and the status upon which they're both there. And so they're both able to effectively do their work uh, effectively today. Thank you. Okay, the next thing is the Councillor reports. This is the annual meeting, so we want to know what you've done since last uh, April. <laughs> Anybody have any reports? Councillor Surratt. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, we had a special meeting of the Industrial, Industrial Commission, and uh, uh, was basically about clinics and uh, Dylan report on Dom Tex, basically. That's what the special meeting was. Uh, also, uh, just to let you know that uh, I was at uh, the uh, Club on the Mirror's Hill and they have installed the pump in the well. And I, I tell you what, the president and the directors were great big smile, believe me, on their face. Uh, also attended the AGM at Clips Shell des Isles, and they do have a full complement of directors, 12 directors for the first time in a long time, so that was a good sign. Uh, attended Mariner Center, Mariner Center meeting, and uh, I also just like to mention that I met with the fire inspector, Ms. Colburn, along with the provincial inspector, uh, Mr. Thibault. They did the St. Joseph Church, and I'm kind of impressed with Mitch. Uh, Whatever he came up with, the provincial inspector said, you're bang on, you've got it, right on it. And I, and I think the uh, provincial inspector was there to try to help him out and guide him and uh, it, was, it was bang on. I was quite impressed and very good to work with. That's it, thank you. Okay, next. Deputy Warren. Thank you. Um, attended the Active Transportation Plan Amendment Workshop. There will be open houses that um, they're gonna be open to the public so that people can come in and kind of give some input on what they'd like to see in terms of um, infrastructure for like sidewalks, trails, those kinds of things. So there will be one on April 25th, Monday, April 25th at Drumlin Heights. And the other one is Tuesday, April 26th at the Plymouth School. So those are open to the public so that they can come and give input. Um, Mariner Center, as Councillor Surrett mentioned, we had a couple of meetings for Mariner Center, so we're still waiting just so that people know we haven't heard any more news on the application. Um, and we really aren't sure when we're going to hear news. We're just kind of waiting. It's, it seems to be a waiting game, but we have moved forward with um, hiring a firm for thinking about the fundraising piece, because we also part of our application said that we we're going to raise a certain amount of dollars in fundraising as well. So we have hired a firm. And in speaking with our politicians, they say it's a good idea to continue on with that plan in order to have those conversations around the fundraising part of it. And we had a meeting last night with the fundraising firm as well. And they're working on a plan to pass along to us to kind of tell us how to do a positive campaign for this fundraising. It was actually a really good meeting last night. Um, also, I've met with um, the group in Belleville for their community signs. So there they put in an ask for grants to organizations that you will see coming up. They have two signs on the go. Um, and I think that that is about everything. Thank you. Thank you. else? Councilor Donaldson. Uh, just the usual 
committee meetings that most people have already mentioned, except for one, we had a policy uh, committee meeting at the landfill or transfer station uh, to go over and do some policies that will be coming to the um, full board at our next meeting for approval. So it's things like vacation pay and safety equipment and stuff like that. So uh, the full board will get to see what we've done on that at that meeting. So other than the regular committee meetings and dealing with the public uh, in, the, in the community, it's business as usual. Okay. How's it board? Yes, um, me as well, just the regular council meetings, uh, industrial meeting, uh, Nikhil, the library, uh, the special meetings we've been having. Um, our community hall is having a little bit of difficulty as well. Um, it's leaking, uh, but I'd like to thank the uh, Women's uh, Auxiliary Fire Department. They donated uh, $5,000 to the community center towards their roof. So that was a very generous uh, donation so that will be a big help. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Dajamal. Yes, uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, spring is in the air and it's uh, time for people to uh, you know, go on the trails and stuff, Pondico Point Trail and I think the trail in, in Camosil, the Russia Saint Pierre, both have uh, some, uh, some local art from uh, local sculptor uh, Alba D'Entremont from Lower West Pondico. So uh, people get a chance to go out on either um, trail and walk and have a look at the, at the sculpture and uh, enjoy some fresh air. Thank you. Councilor okay. Digden. Thank you. Uh, I attended the West Pondico Fire Department, the ratepayers meeting. Uh, watched a meeting of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities on Zoom, uh, trying to help a person down here uh, acquire some housing. A hard, hard job. Honestly, been working with different agencies, and it's it's hard out there for housing. Um, help put up the spring banners on the sidewalk down here. Uh, meeting new residents that have moved into our municipality and answering any questions that they may have. Uh, another thing started doing again, and it's too bad that I had to start doing it, but I've been getting some calls, uh, people uh, with COVID that are isolating. So I started delivering food and that again to some of these people uh, that has COVID and it's, it's definitely going around the area again. So yeah, and uh, I had a chat with the manager of Hope Dial Ride to get some answers that I was being asked by the public down this way about the use and the hope uh, van and stuff like that. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sonia. Yes, thank you. I don't have a whole lot to add. Uh, like Councillor Donaldson, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff in the public and I also did uh, attended the same uh, uh, steering committee meeting for active transportation as Nicole did so uh, uh, people are pretty excited to attend that around here so that's about all I have thank you okay Councillor Woodrow yeah just uh, a few uh, meetings I attended uh, trying to raise some money for Nikhil. We've got a, uh, a small project there for Nikhil. So going from business to business and here in Whitesport. And uh, I've been down and out uh, for a month and a half. So I haven't uh, really done a whole lot, but uh, that's probably all I've got. Thanks. Right. Thank you. I guess that's everybody. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, Warden's report. Is, is listed there. Staff report. Who's going to take that, Alain, or? No. Yep, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief. Number one, you'll see the March uh, <clears throat> permitting report, uh, a, a staff report, 
And what we're seeing is February was a little light um, compared to last year, but both January and March of 2022 were insane compared to last year. So <clears throat> um, it's, you know, when people are looking to do stuff in our community around building permits, it's a big sign of what's happening out there. Um, the tax sale was another big hint on how, how people are really investing a lot more uh, money in land and acquiring land in the area. So we're seeing that it's across, probably it's across Nova Scotia, but you know, uh, not that we would feel that way today, but I think we have the reputation of not having a lot of COVID here in the past, and that might be influencing people's uh, decision-making. Um, all sorts of reasons why that might be. Uh, we know the housing market has exploded in other places and it's now exploding here. And so there's all sorts of reasons why people are coming. And, and so we're seeing that now. So it does put some pressure on some delivery of the specific services that we do in particular, you know, obviously building inspection and also planning. I mean, one of the uh, areas we saw was the sawmill today, but we've had probably three or four building or development uh, agreements occur in the last two years. That doesn't happen in rural Nova Scotia. It's been quite a quite a shift in 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 what we do. So the good news is it makes us better at what we do because we do it more often. But it's uh, it's an adjustment on our end. Uh, I just want to say that uh, budget is in full swing. We're meeting a lot of organizations about their portion of that. West Pubnico, Tusket, and um, uh, Wedgeport for Sewer and East Pubnico as well. We'll be doing that in the next in the coming weeks um days in fact uh, we did a lot of work or i did a lot of work on insurance uh as the renewal came through there was some concerns around that we had a in-camera session on that the last meeting to talk about the details i won't go into them again but the details are included in the report um so if your constituents are wondering or questioning what's happening it's it's in the report um we will be meeting this week on the mariner center partnership with the other two caos that's going quite well we haven't met in a couple of weeks but Every time we talk, we do well. Uh, the Splash Park is coming along as well. We have an agreement drafted <clears throat> between the Splash Park and the Mariner Center. As we are not owners of the Mariner Center, we're not part of that agreement to sign, but we have given our blessing of the agreement because we will likely be signing. Um, obviously there's wind turbines happening in this area, uh, or at least applications for wind turbines, uh, not, the, not the development themselves one in Wedgeport and one in Quinnan. We do get some you know, online questions mostly, but I think you probably get more questions than we do, quite honestly. Like, what is this? What is this about? Uh, I think counselors would get that a lot in the community. Uh, we do have plans on promoting um, that and other things uh, a lot more common uh, using our social media outlets. Um, so that's underway. Um, affordable and, and alternative housing. We know this is a challenge right now. We went out to at probably the wrong time to get um, um, information on our Tusket development. We know that there is a development currently up and running in West Pamico, so we'll go out again and see where the interest might be. And I know that the federal budget announced some funding for housing for municipalities. I don't know enough to, to, be, to, to speak on it right now, but I think it's something that, um, that will be coming out in the near future. Make sure you get that. Uh, work is ongoing on rural internet. We don't you know, we get a lot of questions around this. We don't always know what they're up to. Uh, sometimes they're on our project and sometimes they're doing stuff on their own. So, um, but we have not yet been built for our portion of the work, uh, which is understandable because they're behind schedule a bit. But we expect that the investment of almost $700,000 will come out in the next 12 months. Um, and that'll be part of your capital budget. We'll talk about budgets uh, through the month of April and May. So you'll be tired of it. So I won't go into it now. Uh, a lot of projects are getting going, like the Wedgeport Wastewater is one of them um, that's getting going. Uh, and that's, a, that's probably the, the largest planned capital project we have this year uh, is the Wedgeport Septic Tank Project. Um, uh, other projects of note I just mentioned was the, um, the rural internet and other things such as, um, uh, there's, there's quite a few uh, couple of hundred thousand dollar projects that will be presented to you sooner rather than later. Um, we have funding applications, one outstanding for ACOA. Um, we know Hope died or I, we talked about that before. Um, the Veterans Banner Project, again, well underway. Scott Sedet is leading it from an admin 
uh, perspective, we're making sure the budget is prepared for it. <clears throat> um, we are looking at certain other things around um, initiatives that other municipalities have taken before us. One is the four day work week. So this week in our leadership meeting, we'll be having, um, we'll be having a, uh, a conversation about what that might look like for us. Um, and uh, as well as uh, uh, in terms of other parts of the staff report, I would invite you to look at them. Finance, uh, archives, fire inspections, et cetera, are all there. Uh, I won't speak to other people's work. Uh, I can only speak uh, to my own and sometimes to Scott's. So, uh, but we're, we're constantly working together and we do have a weekly leadership meeting that goes through a lot of these issues and the communication right now is very strong. So that's the end of my report, unless there are any questions about my or any other uh, contributions. Councilor Scott. Uh, this question, of course, goes to the CAO. Uh, I, I saw on the, uh, I saw on, on, on your, on your, 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 your part, and uh, I saw there was a vehicle, a fifty thousand dollar vehicle. Uh, obviously, that's being added to the fleet. Uh, that would be a, in, would that be in our, in this year's budget, as it was in budget, or was it budgeted in last year? I didn't see it, but. Uh, no. And the purpose and the purpose for the vehicle. Correct. So th through you, uh, Warden, it's uh, two twofold. One is we did have a budget last year for mostly facilities maintenance equipment. Uh, it was a little less than thirty thousand dollars. There were two major pieces we had to buy. One was a new tractor. I'm quite sure because the other one come end of life. So the answer is no. We did not budget that in this year's in last year's fiscal. We will be budgeting in this year's fiscal. Um, it, yes, it says 50,000, but that includes HST. So the number is quite a bit less than that, uh, number one. And number two, the purpose of that is, is, through, uh, is to be utilized through uh, operations and protection services. So because we've added uh, a couple of individuals to work in both departments, we require a vehicle in order to accommodate that. Um, we also have safety issues associated with some of those uh, gentlemen that go in quite remote areas in order to do their business. So we know that it's cheaper for us to purchase and operate our own vehicle than to pay the mileage to a third party. And uh, we know that already, we've done it more than once. And uh, the other point I would just raise with that is the, uh, is the fact that um, um, uh, the insurance associated with that would not touch their personal insurance. It would be through our insurance program, which is extraordinarily important, especially if something bad happens. So the, the, that's the logic behind it. We are actually increasing our fleet by quite a bit these days. And, um, and we have considered things like e-vehicles, like electric vehicles uh, as part of that decision, but we're really not there. Uh, the, the, the math doesn't work for the electric vehicles. And of course there's charging and other issues associated with that. So. That's where we stand. We will be presenting that to your budget, capital budget, in, in the coming fall. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Anybody else? Councilor Woodrow. A question for our CAO. I know we got a meeting tomorrow on the Westport sewer system. Uh, do you have an exact date on when we're going to start with the sewer system? I know that I know the uh, the ground's really wet. Is that an issue? Uh, they're not prepared to do that just yet. I believe the timing is closer to the early summer before they start uh, getting into some of the the construction side. I know we've spent about fifty thousand dollars so far on uh, planning uh, through EXP. EXP will lead um, the execution of the contract, which means. If we hire a contractor, it will come under their recommendations. So they'll be helping us with that. Um, and we don't know when they'll be available to actually do the work because we know how busy they all are. Our intention is to go out in late spring to have the work done in, in, in the summertime. However, um, that will depend on the availability of the contractors um, in, in that project. Our objective would be to complete the project in this fiscal year. So even if we don't get it done in the summer, um, 
you know, some of that might bleed in the fall or even in the early winter. Hopefully we can get all of that work done. Um, the billing for that project, and what I mean, what I mean by billing is the residential portion of that bill will happen in May, June of next year. So they'll have 12 months before they see a bill uh, from us. And at that point, they'll have one of two options. One would be to pay the whole thing, and the other would, would be to, to do a 10-year repayment plan with us with interest. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Deputy Warden. Thank you. This question is also for the, the CAO. Um, do you have any idea when we will be, I, I had this question asked to me, when we'll be um, approving our grants to organizations? Ah. Roughly-ish. Okay. We usually <laughs> ish approve it in May. Um, okay. okay. Is going to be in three days. Um, depending on the complexity of, of the applications, it might take us a while to, to coordinate. I know that the deputy CAO and Chantal, our, our municipal clerk in training, will be inviting all of you to a meeting so that we can work out some of the, the small things together. Um, I think traditionally the administration did that for you, but you know we're limited. You, your, your knowledge will be useful here, especially around, well, do you think that goes here or do you think that goes to another pot of money, et cetera? So those decisions can be made before we actually dole out the cash. So we would do that. We'd likely do that at end April-ish, maybe. That will depend on when we can actually do it. Okay. And uh, early to mid-May would be when we present this. And we usually do it at the same time as the budget deliberations because both decisions happen at the same time. How much okay. are we going to dole out and who are we going to dole it to are usually happening in mid-May. Uh, and finally, we usually start distributing money, uh, I think it's July. In some cases, we've seen it in June, but we usually watch the cash flow uh, because you don't receive any taxation uh, payments until usually mid to late June. So I would say early July for people to expect the money unless there's a reason why it needs to go earlier. Okay, thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Yes, uh, a question for the CEO, CAO. Um, we're going to have a pre uh, grants meeting to go over, from what I understand, like some of the special event type of grants. Will we still be doing, um, and I'm hoping we'll still be doing the spreadsheet where we go back and we look it over as individuals and put a number on, on each grant, and then we do like an average? Because uh, some of you may not remember when we started to sit down and go one item at a time to see who got what with nine of us arguing, I don't ever want to go back to that again. So it's been working great the last few years, the way we're doing it. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope this pre-grants meeting is, isn't to go what I do, what I just said. I hope it's just that we still get that opportunity to do it we, the way we've been doing it lately. Is that right? Through you, Warden, that is correct. So what, basically the, the pre-meeting is to make sure that we get the pots correct. Uh, sometimes there's special stuff and, and maybe, it, maybe it belongs in regular grants, maybe it does not. So let's, let's coordinate that. So if we've got pots of money that we have to deal with, let's put them in the right pot. And then the grants to organizations process, now that we have everything lined up, the same process would apply. So you would be able to look at your um, your total and everybody that applied and apply your av your what you think it should be and then we would take the average of not. So the purpose of the meeting is to get that part right, not necessarily to change the way that you make that decision in the end. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Sonia. There you are. Finally, couldn't get it. Uh, this is a, for, a, a follow-up on Councillor Boudreaux's uh, questions on the sewer systems. The uh, pumping, uh, we've had issues on, on, on pumping out the, uh, the septic tanks. And the question was, uh, is the homeowner uh, responsible for pumping the septic or is the municipality 
Um, that's that's the basic question. Yeah, through you, Warden, it's the response. If they are on our wastewater program and that we helped fund the new septic system on their property, the responsibility to pump that sewer remains with the municipality, which is one of the reasons why we charge a fee. Uh, it's one of many reasons, but that would be the principal one. Um, we follow the standards of that septic tank. Not every septic tank is the same, but let's just say every, you know, you, you want to pump that at least once every four years. So in some cases, it's more often than that, depending on the nature of the, the tank or the amount of use. Uh, it is our responsibility. So we've had situations in Wedgeport, just so that you're aware, where we had a, uh, an unfortunate uh, repair issue where there was a and, um, and there was some minor damage on that particular person's property. I'm not going to disclose who. And um, you know, again, that repair and the, and, the, and the costs associated with that kind of thing rests with the municipality, which is why it's important to get the rate correct, because if we have these ongoing issues that we need to have enough funds to pay for it. Um, so yeah, it does rest with us and we do have a schedule that we will honor. We haven't done that many yet because we haven't really gotten to four years for many of them. But in our budget of the, this year and the coming year, we have a schedule of quite a few that we would arrange to have come. So if I may, uh, the proper way to do this is to, if this happens on the weekend would be to call the emergency number and not call the pumper yourself because from what I understand the municipality uh, has it uh, uh, uses its own contract pumping, which is cheaper than what the homeowner would do. And if so, uh, these um, the, the people with these uh, uh, septic systems uh, had a hard time finding this this number. So I would suggest a mail out or something to each person that that owns one of these septic systems. Sure, and maybe it's a good time to remind people of that, maybe put on a magnet or something. But uh, uh, I know that when they were first on the system, they were given that information. Um, I, I don't know why it was difficult for them to find it, and it could be on our end too. Um, so we can look into that. But uh, we do have an on-call person. Um, so if that issue happens on the weekend, we do have an on-call person that that is that is happy to take that call and coordinate. In terms of costs, I. I I'm pretty sure we'd be cheaper, but I'm not convinced um, that we would be significantly less expensive. So worst case scenario, somebody gets it done, but, but at the end, it really should be, if they did that, they should be contacting us and we should be making arrangements to, to make them whole. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Board draw. Again, a question or uh a comment just for uh, for uh, Anna, our CAO. Uh, I think that the property you're talking about, the property was sold to the to the original uh, to the owner that belongs to it now. She wasn't involved in um, getting that sewer system on the property. The uh, the owners sold the house to her. I. I I do believe if it's the same person we're talking about. Um, yeah, like I said, I won't disclose who it is, but if it's the yeah. same person, then they were in contact with us, which is a good thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that they knew to get a hold of us in some way, shape, or form. They did know, and and yeah. uh, and and you know that's a great reminder, counselor, about perhaps you know going back to these civic addresses and saying you know you maybe you're new here, but uh, <laughs> let me let me fill you in a little bit on the suicide. yeah. But now in every situation where there's a property that has been sold, if, if that person did not pay that septic fee in full, they had an amount owing on that property, which is a lien on that property. So what would happen is, is that, let's say if I'm selling it to you and I still owe money, um, that would have to be satisfied before the transaction occurred. Yes. The person that purchased it would like, to, if there was a balance, if there was a balance, would be aware that that septic system and that program existed because it would come off of it would come off of the the price adjustment uh, for that yeah. property. So, but if they paid it in full, it wouldn't be that. So it could still be a mystery. So, it's a good point to raise, and I'll I'll pass that on to our director. Yeah, yeah, that's you made good points there. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? 
seeing no one. Thank you for the report, which brings us to notice, notice to council, and that's the community litter cleanup policy amendments. The policy had to be amended for different reasons. And I can pass this on to either our deputy CAO or CAO. Okay. I promise to be brief on this one. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the couple reasons why we had to make changes to this program. Number one, we love the program. So, and we know council loves the program. So our motivation was how do we make this program better? Not how do we get rid of this program? Because I can tell you that um, there's a lot of red tape associated with programs like this, a lot. So if you can imagine, there's a lot of like safety issues and other issues that might crop up when you hire an organization to go in a ditch and clean the ditch for you. And again, th this policy is yours. However, the ditch cleanup program is the department, it, it rests with the Department of Transportation and Public Works. So they, we are providing an incentive to the, non to the nonprofit organizations to come in and actually clean those ditches. So the ditches belong to TIR. Uh, they're usually very good with us. Um, and they usually arrange for like pickup of debris and garbage at the end. And so they, they, they partner with us, okay? So the changes, most of the changes I hope are in yellow. Some of the ones that we got rid of are, are biffed. Um, I don't know what that's called, but there, there's a line through it. Um, so the first question we asked ourselves is who's, who's responsible in a situation for insurance purposes? And, and, and then the second question was, who do we want to have responsible uh, for insurance purposes? Because if we said it was them, then it was far more complicated to prove that they had the type of insurance they needed. But if it was us, then it's a lot simpler because we can deal one person, one uh, insurance company. In short, these organizations that are applying for this are considered a group under our insurance policy, much like a volunteer would be considered under this policy which means if they register their group and if they become part of a committee, subcommittee of council, then they are fully insured under your liability insurance, which is, which is what we want. We want them to be covered under that insurance. Um, is, the is the risk high? No, not particularly, but you never know what can happen and, and you know, ditches can be treacherous. There's all sorts of things that can happen. So, you know, will something happen? Well, I'm not gonna guess, but we want to make sure that people are covered in case they, that it did. <clears throat> so our responsibility as municipality is to choose who they are, which is, is outlined in this policy, and how much they can clean, and to monitor their work. Um, uh, what you will find in, in the litter policy here, I'm just trying to pull it up now, and I can't seem to. For some reason, the old one is coming up and not the new one. Um, work either. So essentially, uh, this is your seven day notice anyway, so we're not actually approving it. But the liability associated with this is, again, we focused the policy to make sure that we covered the liability, so they could produce the application to us. And they could give us uh, what we call a, a waiver. Um, so the waiver is, is their way of saying, look, like we take responsibility for our own actions. Okay. So that's also in, in the back on Schedule C. Schedule D is the actual application form for transportation. And then what we also want, which is new, is a list of participants. So, you know, Jardin des Petits might go in and do, you know, six kilometers of cleanup, but we want to know who in that organization is cleaning. And they should be telling us who comes off or goes on that list so that we can, we can have an idea of what's going on, okay? We're not doing any criminal checks or anything like that. We are, we are relying on the organization to do that. So we're not actually doing that work. We just need to know who's there. Um, so a lot of the changes get rid of like, it's your liability organization and it's, it changes the language to it's our liability, but you got to do this, this, and this. Okay. Um, we'd like to get this done sooner rather than later. We can't pass it today. And, and I have to apologize. You don't have the most updated copy 
um, on this or, or for some reason I can't open it um, and that might be on me. Um, but the new one would have a list of like safety uh, tips and tricks that, that they'd have to follow. Things like wear gloves, you know, don't pick up needles, et cetera. So it's very, very prescriptive uh, in that. So I can send you a copy of this uh, in full. It's not the one that's attached there and give you that seven day notice because you can't pass it here anyway. And I'm gonna stop there. And if there are any questions or concerns about the policy itself, let me know. But uh, right now the budget's at 18,000 for the year. And we're looking to clean about 110 kilometers worth of ditches uh, this year, both spring and fall. So um, COVID hopefully not getting in the way. Questions, Councilor Surratt. Uh, Ale, you raised a good point there about you. You mentioned needles, and I just got thinking. One of our own employees had got stuck with a needle. So, uh, in a case like this, I, I, I think I understood what you're saying. So, if somebody gets stuck with a needle and they had to go, like one of our employees, be off of work, then our insurance would kick in. Is that would that be right? What I'm saying. Our insured insurance would cover the uh, old, almost impossible and perhaps rare occasion where somebody would have their hand in a needle. So the reason why I say that is because we provide all of the equipment necessary for them to not put a hand on anything. So, you know, they have the, the, the pick when they go in there. So if they're putting their hands on stuff, they're not following our instructions. Um, we're, we're trying to be as safe as possible we realize that this is not always a safe situation. And really, if it's, an, if it's an area that isn't safe, it's up to our municipal officials to assess whether it's not safe enough for a group to go in. In a lot of cases, the ditches are great and they're easy to, to do but that. So yeah, these things do happen. And, yeah. and if it happened to staff, we have OHS policies that, that address those things and we won't go into the HR details, but, but we, we do have that. And um, um, Anyway, so that, yes, that's the answer to your question. So they do take risks and we try to mitigate that by, um, you know, uh, putting it in the agenda, in the policy. Thank you. Councilor Degden. Uh, thank you. I've read it over. Uh, I really like it. It's, it's well done. I really like the part of the liability uh, through the municipal, municipality. And it's something like, you know, our CAO said, you hope things never will happen, but at the same time, the potential is there for something to happen. So it's nice to know that if something does happen, these people that are out volunteering and that will be covered through uh, the municipality. And the only other thing I see where um, if we just want to get it going fairly fast or whatever, you just do want to get it going. The only thing I'm saying is down on 5B, two members of council shall be named to this committee. And I'd definitely be willing to be on that committee if council wants me to be. Thank you. Thank you. CAO. Just, I'm so glad you raised that, uh, Councillor Digden. It's just that the, the, this is a subcommittee of council, which is the other major difference that you might have. So you get involved in a way that you never did before. So we may have a kickoff meeting that has members of this council, committee of council, and that committee of council can change every year as the applications change. But the councillors that sit on it would remain. So, um, so thank you for offering, that's awesome. And uh, we would be creating that committee of council if the policy passes. All right, okay. Anybody else? Seeing none. So what we need is a motion to accept the first reading. We don't, oh, it's just the first reading. We don't pass this, okay. Next one is for decision and the approval of the second reading of what we just went through with the uh, public hearing development agreement uh, application. Uh, 333 Highway 335 for the sawmill. So the recommendation was to accept. So Councillor Donaldson, that's a motion. I'll make that motion. Okay. 
seconded. I saw a couple of hands. Councillor Councillor Bork. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded. Carried. The next one, it's we're being asked. It's Lyme Disease Awareness Month, May in May. And there's a, a, a proclamation here which reads, whereas Lyme disease is a serious illness caused by the bite of black like a black leg tick infected with the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi, <laughs> or whatever, whatever that means. I hope you all know. Whereas black leg tick ticks carry a variety of diseases or illnesses can now be found in all parts of Nova Scotia. And whereas awareness, education, and practicing preventative measures such as daily tick checks and proper tick removal can help reduce your chances of contracting tick-borne diseases. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Warden Danny Muse, on behalf of the municipality of District of Argyle, to hereby proclaim May 2022 as Lyme Disease Awareness Month. Are we okay with doing that? Uh, Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, I have no problem with that, but I'm just wondering, I thought what are the pro proclamation proclamations weren't supposed to be coming to council anymore because they just continuously, continuously come one after another. And I thought we stopped doing them just for that simple reason. Any, do we, anybody remember that or, or aware of that as well? Councillor Shret, you're saying the same thing? Yeah. Okay. CL Muse. I uh, also have that same recollection. Um, so I, I would have been the one that probably offered to put it on the agenda for you. Um, I'm just getting a little mixed message because last year when we when we talked about Lyme disease, it was it was a long discussion, I remember. And so it was one of these items that we wanted to add. So I didn't know which I didn't want to be the one <laughs> to say, well, that's no good or this is good. Or, right. Um, you know, I'm happy to I'm I'm happy to do whatever council wishes on these. We don't actually get nearly as much as we used to, uh, to uh Councillor Donaldson's point. However, if we started doing them, perhaps they would come crashing. <laughs> Again, I really don't know, but um, it, that particular piece is entirely up to you. I don't know that we have a motion to that effect, but we certainly have kind of like an agreement uh, that happened back then that was like, uh, well, maybe you won't do this. So if I brought it uh, inappropriately, my apologies to you, um, and I'm happy to do whatever whatever the council wishes on this. So what's the wish for council? Con Councillor Digden and then Councillor Threat. Uh, thank you. Uh, I honestly don't know about the proclamation bit because I haven't been around that long. Uh, I'm just wondering if we, you know, they are a good thing uh, and I, I support them. Just wondering if we could have like a blanket policy on proclamations, maybe not so much coming to the meetings, but um, our warden would look it over and if he sees fit to sign it and put it up on our website. Uh, it could be up on our website, on our municipality website. Just. Mm -hmm. Counselor, is that it, uh, Councilor Dickett? Did you it, it, just an idea, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, I know the people that send these in and that they'd like to see them supported in that. And yeah. I'd be 100% behind our ward. And if he feels as though it's, it's a worthy cause and he'd like to sign it and put it up you know, or have it put up on our website, I, I, I'd be okay with that by all means. Right. Councillor Surratt. Uh, I'd like you to, to get staff to look uh, at, uh, we have a policy on that. We voted, seems to me that we had voted on, voted on that not to have it on. I think there was a motion made. Oh, no, that was quite a, a long time ago. And, but if I could uh, ask staff to have a look before we, all of a sudden go and say yes, it'll be up to our warden. If we already have a motion that was passed, well, gee whiz, we're kind of going against that. So if you could have staff look at that, then come back to us and maybe address what Councillor Digden said. Yeah, 
because we do have another meeting before May, so yeah, for sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Councillor Sonia. Thank you. I I all I have to say, I think I think uh, uh, Lyme disease is an important topic and and uh, mis misdiagnosed quite a bit. And I wish there was a rapid test like you have for COVID because you see you see people either being misdiagnosed or don't get no diagnosis at all and end up extremely sick. And we've all heard those stories and and uh, we want to, as, as a municipality or as a council, we try to make our community safer. And I think uh, we have a, 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 an obligation to our community to try to make it safer. And that includes adopting uh, uh, this, this proclamation for, for, for ticks. I, I'm totally behind it because I think too many people are getting misdiagnosed with it. Thank you. Councillor Dick then. Uh, thank you. And, and I agree 100% with what Councillor Sonia said. And I believe last year, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe we even had uh, some information up on our website about ticks and the removal of ticks and what ticks to watch for and stuff like that. So that might be something else that, you know, whether or not we've got a policy or not, but just some information uh, for the public because it's, they're definitely out already. They're, they're well out, uh, yeah. you know, and they're dangerous. There's no saying they're not. I see one uh, person shaking um, their head here this evening and, uh, that knows all about Lyme disease and it's it's a hard disease and, and for a long time it can have effects on a person. Anybody else? Thank you. So do we want to wait and see then if there is a policy on that? If there is a policy or if there's a motion, I guess it would be difficult for us to do that if we, if we have a policy that says that we can't. But uh, at least uh, that will give us at least until the next meeting to see where we stand with this. And then we can decide at that meeting what we're going to do with it. Is that, is, is that okay? So does that mean that we defer this one here to the, to the next meeting? We should defer this, this item. So we need a motion to defer this. Councillor Digden and Councillor Surratt moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, Harry. The next one is the, uh, the uh, um, vehicle, the tender that was opened and that was opened uh, on April 7. And uh, there was only one proposal. And apparently some of the reason was some of the uh, some of the dealers just couldn't get their hands on, on the vehicle to, to, to sell, like for what we were looking for. So I guess it's uh, the recommendation is that, uh, is to accept this proposal. The tender documents and proposal are, are attached to the memo here. So it's right here, what, what they would be buying. So we need a motion whether to accept or to reject this. Councillor Bork, did you raise your hand? No? Okay, that's a motion. Motion by Councillor Bork, seconded by Councillor Digden. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. The next one is Okay, for discussion, correspondence sent to Premier Houston regarding proposed provincial non-residential property tax and the transfer tax. That's something that the government has, has in, their, uh, in their budget where they're going to start charging uh, non-residential uh, property owners an extra property tax. And this is a, a, a letter that went from, I think it was Lunenburg, Chester. I think I 
I forwarded this to everybody, I do believe, this letter here. So I guess I guess what we need to know is, you know, how we feel about that and how would it would affect what how would that affect our municipality if they did that, right? I mean, it's gotta affect the municipalities, there's no doubt. Uh our our non-residents gonna start selling, get getting out of it, or people that, that are people that are planning on maybe buying won't buy. I, I don't know. And it, and I think it has more more of an effect than just the fact that it, that they don't that they sell or whatever. I mean, when they're here, it's good for the economy as well, you know. So in a way, maybe if if our CEO wants to add anything like what, what you feel we should be concerned about on this or Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, you, you said that the, the uh, provincial government already has it in their budget. I oh, was aware there. of that. Is, is it like sure is it was it? in their Oh yes, it was in their budget. So it, it, has it been the budget passed. hasn't passed yet. Not that but I'm they, aware of. But they're a majority government, right? So in all essence, it's passed. That's right. Oh, yeah, so, for sure. Okay, just wondering. I mean, yeah, I don't like it either, but is there actually anything you can do about it if it's already in the budget? I don't know. Maybe if there was enough uh, uh, opposition from the municipalities, I don't know if that would make a difference or not. You don't know. But do we need to discuss this anymore or do we just wait to see what happens? Councillor Sray. Uh, just probably just to Richard. Uh, Richard, uh, I know what you're saying. If it's on the but, if it's in the budget, uh, although there, there could be amendments, that was the only point I was going to make. If they see enough complaints, they could make an amendment or they could not. You know, I just, uh, just want to add that in. Oh, I agree with you, Guy. I don't like it one bit either. It's just. No. I mean, sometimes you just talk. You're talking just to hear yourself talk because there's nothing you can do. But I mean, if there is a chance to head for the firm to listen, because I, well, the letters from from Chester, but there's a lot more uh, places other than Chester that are heavily on the non-residential properties. I mean, we have a fair bit here, but there's places that have a, a way higher percentage than us. And okay. I'm just wondering if other people other than Chester are up in arms. Go ahead, CL. Uh, I speak to that point. Uh, the answer is yes. There's quite a few uh, different municipalities that are up in arms around this and a lot of non-resident folk, obviously. I mean, if you think of the impact of this, you know, our residential rate is $1.09 right now. So they're looking at $2. So a non-resident would go from $1.09 to $3.09 uh, when this came into effect. Uh, we will not be collecting that tax. That's another weird part about this is that it would be probably finance or somebody provincial that would do that. Uh, the letter is quite well constructed. Um, um, the letter is quite well crafted, but I think I would have sent you an email from the province themselves that has a link and each of you have the ability to provide comments or even flip that link to somebody who you think might want to provide comments. Um, I think I would encourage that because that's, you know, if we don't say anything, then they're just assumed that we're you're accepting. Uh, having an issue with it. But I, I think there's enough people that do have an issue with this. Um, my understanding is that, and I did see a question come up on the chat screen here. It, my understanding is that that's provincial revenue, right? So it's not gonna come to us, at least not directly. Um, I can also tell you that we're negotiating with the province on a new cost sharing agreement. Um, I'm not part of that, but it's the, uh, the association of municipalities that are doing that. And uh, as you are aware, Premier Houston promised a doubling of equalization payments or whatever we call it now, um, which doubled our contribution from 150 something to 300 and something. Um, they're not budgeting for that this year, but they are budgeting something. And, and I don't know what that is, but I know that if an MOU or if a new agreement is spun out, that it might mean, for instance, and I'm, this is a guess, but it might mean that some of those revenues might, might offset costs that we're paying for on their behalf, you know? So like RCMP, not RCMP, um, school or corrections or housing. 
So there's all sorts of things going up in the air right now. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say this is good for us municipalities or bad for us municipalities. But it's quite easy to say it's probably bad for non-residents um, who are looking to pay this tax. So um, again, I'll just say this a second time, is that that tax will not be levied by us, nor will it be collected by us. So there's still a lot to be ironed out around what that even means, because um, taxation on property is usually the first lien on a property if they don't pay their taxes. And that's usually a municipal power. So I don't know. I, I mean, I know enough to be dangerous on this one. But I would say you have a link, um, flip it to the people you might think have an opinion on this or not, and have them you know, kind of click the link and go through the process to, to say whether they like or dislike this. Okay, I've got Councillor Schritt and Councillor Dickton. Uh, I just like to say that my brother has uh, from Ontario has some resource and he's paying three dollars and fifty four cents. So he's going to double. It might double. So he called me up and he's selling. He can't hack it no more. <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Dickton. Uh, thank you. I'm just wondering if this is something that NSFM would be willing to take the lead on because like individual municipalities going in or a few municipalities going in and saying, you know, we don't really agree with it or whatever. Whereas if you got NSFM going in, that's representing a, a lot of the municipalities and stuff like that, like, you know, their power numbers usually and just looking and wondering if that's something they'd be interested in taking a lead on or if we could find that out and I believe the um, provincial government what they're saying is these monies that they're going to be collecting and this extra tax money it would be uh, going back towards uh, housing, housing and stuff like this so it's what they're yeah. earmarked it for anyway supposedly now that's what you know that's what I heard so, but just wondering if there's something that NSFM or if we should write them a letter or, or what, maybe our CAO would be better directing us there as to what he thinks. Ask the question, counselor, and I'll wait their response. But usually, I mean, they're on this. They got to be. Um, yeah. But we'll get an official position from them uh, after, after I ask. Mm -hmm. Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I, I don't know the answer to this, and but is there other provinces that do anything similar to this? Is this something new? Uh, like, to me, it sounds like a lot based on what our, what our property tax rate is. Uh, there's municipalities that have higher ones and the, the spread wouldn't be as much, but it seems like a lot like it's tripling. I think of like, Amadus in Roberts Island, that's a massive property. And then you got the Purina dog food people that got the great big horse ranch on McKinnon's neck. And you got, uh, no, most people don't know this one, but Randall's, Randall's Lodge up in back of Argyle Head that, that owned that whole property around that, that whole big lake. And that's just three big ones I was that can think of just sitting here now. And um, there's a lot more. Uh, than that, so I, I would be interested to know what our percentage is in uh, out of province uh, properties assessment uh, for our, for our municipality. Like how 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 large a number are we talking here you know, in overall assessment? So yeah, I don't yeah I don't like it at all. But I think Rael was going to answer yeah. my. Uh, Question yeah, Just a few comments have been made and uh, without getting into details, the legal community is in consternation over it because we're the ones who are going to end up having to administer it by collecting the tax and remitting it. That is on the deed transfer itself, not the collection of the uh, provincial uh, property tax. 
However, I just want to bring it to your attention so that you're fully aware. I would encourage you uh, to read uh, what the exemptions are to the properties. Uh, have you, well, I'm kind of looking here for nodding of heads or shaking of heads, there, uh, whether or not you've seen that. Resource, commercial, and any uh, residential uh, properties that have more than three units uh, rental are exempt from this deed transfer tax on purchase by a non-resident so that you know there are certain exemptions that, that are involved here as well. Uh, so it'd be a good idea. I, I appreciate very much your, you, you guys are asking, uh, you people are asking more questions at this point, point which I think is, is the proper way to go about it. And, uh, but the quicker we, you deal with this, if, if you take a position, because as somebody noted, uh, I think it's Councillor Donaldson, uh, it was announced on March 29, majority government, as soon as the budget passes, it's going to be coming into law. It is not yet law, uh, but, uh, and what retroactivity there will be for April 1, because when they announced it, they said it would be effective April 1. It's very difficult to see how that's going to happen. But anyway, just thought I'd bring those items to your attention for clarification. Thank you. Yes. I yes. you. No, I thought you had your hand up. Oh, Councillor Sonia. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. And uh, basically, if you're raising the taxes for these people, you're you're dis you're you're discouraging them from from purchasing property. And I'm wondering if, similar to Donald Susquen's question about people in, in other provinces, would would the provincial government have done a study in 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 uh, in such that would it discourage people to purchase property because of the uh, hike of taxes and and is there a balance there's uh, I, I I just there's too many unknowns I don't know who who could answer that question but I I can say that I have no idea whether they had a a any sort of like uh, report prior to. I, I can't tell you, um, I don't know. They may have, I'm not aware of it. Um, and it's like, it's to anything, it's like anything else. If you look at other provinces to see what they do, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but every province is different. So I, I, can't, I can't tell you whether they did that or not. Um, it came, I can, can tell you, it came rather as a surprise to, to us because we didn't have any pre-knowledge of that. So if there was a report that was going out on this, um, I would have expected some form of municipal collaboration, but I don't have any evidence of that. So if they did a report, it was on their own for them and not for us, for sure. Councillor Sre. You know, I bet you'd be surprised when you start looking at how many properties are owned by uh, individuals outside the, our province. I was just counting uh, from Suresh Island and Morris Island in our little district here, and I've got seven, seven, seven places that they just come in the summertime as summer homes, and so yeah, I bet we'd be surprised if we got staff to look like Richard Das. Mm -hmm. How many is in our, you know, in, in, in our in our municipality? I just want to mention that. Thank you, Councillor Bohr. Yeah, um, as Councillor Sonia said, it might discourage people from buying properties or just thinking people that move away uh, from our communities and that they want to come back. And uh, I'll give an example just myself. I was away. I purchased the house because I knew I was probably going to come back home. So we had this, we bought the house and we rented it out for a um, number of years. So I don't know if that would discourage people, you know that want to do want to come back. We want people to come back and, and does it look like, you know, it might discourage them coming back. And we're always complaining that we don't have enough people around. So that's my, mm -hmm. my beef. I don't like this at all. Councilor Donaldson. Yeah, I guess this would be a legal question. Uh, what constitutes, if you're Canadian, we won't talk about Americans or, or, or Europeans or anywhere else or international, but if you're Canadian, what constitutes whether you're a resident or not? Like, 
can you live here three months and declare yourself a Nova Scotian? So it's going to be seven months. No, six. 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 So six. you can choose where your residence is if you're six and six. Well, you have to establish it. You don't necessarily choose it, but you have to establish it. There are different ways of uh, proving it. Uh, the acquiring of a driver's license, health card, and physically, and light bills. Variety of, and that's another thing that we're, we're wondering about because one of the exemptions, another exemption as well that I didn't mention earlier is that if somebody says, oh, but I'm moving into the province within six months, they will be exempt from the tax. So the question in, in the legal community is if, First of all, what document do they file in order to say that when they're purchasing it? Number one. Number two, do they pay the tax now and reclaim it later on once they've established their, it's just, it's just up in the air. It's, it's, I'm not going to talk about the policy that's your bailiwick, but insofar as the implementation and it befalling the legal, legal community, because we were notified within 15 minutes of the announcement uh, of this coming through. Oh, legal community, this is going to be coming through. Watch out, we're going to be sending you all kinds of stuff. And it's like, I, my jaw dropped. I could not, I'm surprised nobody came to see if I was good or not because uh, we just couldn't believe it as uh, the CAO mentioned. I heard one person say that in, who's involved in the real estate industry said they had gotten some indication maybe six weeks ago, but I'm not sure how. We had nothing. We heard absolutely nothing. And so those are the things. So, so th there's that six month issue that we have no two clues how that's going to be implemented. So as I said, from the legal community, fr from the legal side, it's not so much the policy. We have our opinions on policy, uh, but I'll, that's not my, for me to share here. But uh, implementation is going to be something that we're, we're concerned with, including that six month residential issue. Thank you, Councilor Donaldson. CEO Muse. Uh, two very quick things. Number one, uh, we have a cap on assessments at the PBSC, which means a, you have the cap if you are a resident, which if you're not, you don't. So PBSC has data on who is resident and non-resident, whether it falls within the same uh, definition, I can't tell you. But I have asked for that information uh, from our contact in PBSC, so we hope to get that to you fairly soon. Number two, I did email all of you. I did get a response from the CEO from the NSFM. Um, their answer is essentially, we got a lot of information from a lot of different municipalities, but we're not, we have no idea where this came from. So they don't have any data on, you know, even what the 80, the estimated $80 million taxation revenue, what that looks like, they have no data. So they were not involved all, obviously in any sort of study either. And I think, I guess, you know, at the risk of, you know, you can discuss it as long as you want, but but I think we're still a little early, uh, as it seems, based on the discussion. We're still a little early on the details. So, um, you know, if council wants to do something here as an individual, you can through the link. If you want to do something as a council, it might be best to do so when we have more information, so that we can actually say what the position might be. And uh, and and your, all your questions have been great, and I'm hopefully. Hopefully that the uh, that I, I flipped every one of them to the places that hopefully have those answers. So we'll see if that helps you at all. Uh, Councilor Dachamal. Thank you, Warden Muth. Uh, could we get a, maybe a, a little insight from our MLA Colton Lebanon sits on the government? Uh, is there some way we can get in contact with him and just to see where all this came from and, you know, doesn't seem like any municipality was consulted. So uh, it'd be good to kind of get some background where, you know, where this is coming from and what their, you know, their plan is. Because yeah. I, I don't like it either. So it's just, uh, but I'd like to be able to get some information to grasp and like uh, Councilor Sonia wrap my head around it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I've heard a couple of, uh, recommendations like uh, check with NSFM whether they would they would uh, maybe take the, the helm at that and, and, and speak on behalf of municipalities which probably they have I'm not sure but and then like like uh, Councillor Dotmar just said as well because I thought of doing the same thing contacting our MLA to see what where did this come from what you know what what was the, the 
how did they decide this? And I guess they're looking at ways to generate revenue and probably that's one of them that they're looking at it. But that could be at the detriment, detri, det, at the detriment of, <laughs> I couldn't get my tongue around that one, the detriment of, of, of municipalities or of other parts of the province, you know what I mean? Like other governments, so. Uh, Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, just before we go off the air, uh, Ellen said that you got a response back from Jennifer Spencer. And I'm surprised here. There's actually member municipalities that are in favor of this and others that are strongly wow. opposed. So okay. uh, I just wanted to let, people, let you guys know that before we go off air. Yeah. I'm surprised to see that, actually. I'm actually yeah. quite surprised. So yes. there you go. You think you get it all figured out? And that comes along. <laughs> Was there anybody else? So I guess we move on. And I, I think it's a good idea to talk to our MLA for sure. There's no doubt. And it doesn't have to. I mean, we can eat individual or whatever. However, we want to do that for sure. Right? At least get some kind of a explanation from from the MLA on what he knows and how he feels, what he feels about it as well. So, okay, are you okay with that? Okay. The next one is Visual Heritage Project. And that's an email that I received along with Councillor Bork. We were the two that were, that were uh, uh, sent the email. And this is from a Mark Periard. It's a French letter. And apparently what he does, he, he, sent a, a, he sent a video of one of his projects, which I think was Il, Il de la Madeleine. Yeah. And um, I guess it's, it's a way, it's to promote the area. Um, Councilor Brooke because she was, I figured he knew her since he only included her in the, uh, in, in this. So we were talking and she agreed to give him a call and maybe you can explain, Councillor Brooke, what he told you that he does. Okay, so um, he's a professional, uh, I guess he was into I don't know, filming or some kind of a professional in that line and he's retired and he likes projects. So um, he told me that he, he, um, he went to the Madeline Islands with this project. All he's asking is for a place to stay, maybe a meal a, a, meal a day if possible. Um, anyway, he, uh, he, does, he interviews uh, volunteers of the communities and that, that contribute major in the communities that do good for the communities or whatever. And um, then he makes a little uh, uh, capsule or whatever, and we can use it to promote our area. And all he's asking is that we don't make money off of it. So uh, if you're gonna promote your area, well, it's gonna bring maybe revenue anyway. So um, he was a very nice man to talk to. And he had, uh, he said, I can always call him back if I had more questions. So after I finished talking to him, um, I called the Madeline Islands because they did a, uh, he did a, a, a visual there and it was in the English sector in the Madeline Islands. And I called the municipality and I was talking to the uh, administrator. Uh, I think it's the assistant administrator, Matt Zien, And she told me that everything was legit and it was a very good experience. And the person that he did, one of the persons that he did interview was a, a, a retired man. He was old, he died three weeks later. So they were so thrilled that he had, they had interviewed him on this project with the co-op and it had to do with the fisheries. And it's, uh, anyway, to make a long story short, it's, uh, he, he seems to be interesting. So it's something that you could go on there. You can go listen to the video and uh, it's something that you can look at. And he does that as a volunteer. He, he doesn't charge except we would have to put him up. That's basically his 
is asked. It's that it, it may be, like you said, one meal. I mean, I don't know. It, it's something maybe, I don't know if he could, if he could give us a presentation through Zoom at some point or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we have, yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, that's fine. No, I mean, I, I'm gonna ask a question. The person asked me, and they do something like this, but not really to that extent where they interview people. And he won't know who to contact because he does that that type of uh, uh, of um, uh, he's got a he's a photographer, and I gave him I told him to call Scott Surratt. Did you ever get a, a call from someone local to see if we we're interested in him doing something like that? He never contacted you, maybe. I don't recall uh, a phone call from that particular gentleman. I did, re I did receive another uh, call with somebody interested in doing a film, but I don't think it was this particular gentleman that we're talking about. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I mean, I just had to bring it here because we, we got that and I wanted to bring it to council to see what you guys thought, whether we want to further investigate this, whether we want to uh, uh, at least maybe if he's willing to give us some kind of a presentation through Zoom or whatever. And Councillor Sonia, you had your hand up, sorry. I think- uh, uh, Councillor had... Digden had his hand up before I did, so. Oh, okay, Councillor Digden. Uh, the only thing I was gonna ask, uh, and maybe Kathy or Councillor Bork, sorry, is how long would he be looking at staying around in the area? About a week, I think. He told me about a week. Okay, yeah. And he's looking for a room and a meal a day? He said a place to stay and if possible, maybe a meal, you know, if it's whatever, like if it's a place that uh, a cottage or whatever, you can, it'll be fine, but yeah. So that's all. Only thing only thing I was getting at, if it's something that council wishes and he's looking just for a room or to stay, he's more than welcome to stay here and I'll guarantee him a meal of uh, chances are seafood a day if that's what he wants. But anyway, if that's so the wishes of council, that's all. I, I think that council yeah. should be, sorry, uh, okay. council, should maybe, council should maybe, um, I don't know, maybe we could meet with him or a Zoom or something. Maybe if you had more questions, you could ask him directly uh, of exactly what he does. But I'm not sure Do we have people around here that, that do that sort of thing too. So, you know, oh. you want somebody local as well. All right. Councilor Sonier. Thank you. <clears throat> it kind of sounds too good to be true, but I, I believe every word that you guys have said. However, I think a week is a short period of time to do to do a good job at whatever you do. I, I, I look back and I think we all have um, people in mind that have passed and said, geez, we should have had that one on, on video and recorded that, that, that story of his or hers. And so that it's appealing to me to have someone, uh, you know, tape someone and interview someone um, of our local heritage here. We have too many that that uh, we wish we had done before and never did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I j but I just think a week is short to do a good job, but at least it's a week. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to, I can I can uh, respond because I didn't even respond to that. I sometimes I, I you get emails and you wonder, you know, I mean, especially when it comes just. To, to, to one person, like it doesn't go to council, but uh, I can certainly respond and see if there's any way that we could have him on, on a Zoom for questions and see what he says. Councillor Dantemal. Uh, thank you, Warren. Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, like copyright and legally who owns the material. Uh, it's just a volunteer, uh, you know, mm -hmm. 
should there be some type of contract between the municipality and this gentleman, or how would that all work? It's just, you know, to me, it's uh, it sounds great, and but uh, you know, who who owns the material? Uh, can we use it? Can, can't we use it? He said we're not supposed to make money, uh, but could we use it for tourism? Uh, you know, just those types of questions. Okay. Might be a legal question for our solicitor. <laughs> I'll have to speak with that gentleman uh, and find out what what he's up to. That's for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Digden. Uh, thank you. The only thing I would say, and again, I think there's too many unknowns here. Yeah. So uh, I definitely, personally, uh, my myself, like the CR warden, have a chat with him again. Uh, see what he has in mind, um, stuff like that, and touch base maybe on what some of Cal Councillor Dontremont said, and uh, if we could use it like uh, after he leaves for tourism or whatever the case may be, or to show showcase our municipality and go from there. Because really, right now this evening, there's too many unknowns as to what, mm -hmm. what it's yeah. all about, really, I think. Okay. Yeah, we can follow up on that. Okay. So that concludes that. Uh, that was correspondence. There's no financial request. Any agenda topic for next meeting or notice of motion? Councillor Sret. Uh, I don't know if this one is for a topic for next meeting, but... Uh... Something that uh, you said, Warden, maybe not, maybe not when we were in, when we started the meeting, but prior to it, we we're discussing about meeting, you know, again together, all together, yeah. which uh, um, like most of you, the same thing, but uh, I certainly like to, 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 to mention this to everybody, uh, all, all the uh, counselors, that, uh, you know, some people have, uh, Certain certain restrictions, certain issues with health, and uh, before I, I wouldn't want to be. Let's say if I had some issues, I I don't certainly want to tell everybody uh, that that's here. If I've got some issues, it's my personal health thing, and uh, I would certainly like to see a hybrid when it comes to because when all of a sudden there's a big influx, sometimes I'll be honest with, with you, I for this meeting because there was so much going around, I felt more comfortable. Being on Zoom, I prefer to be face-to-face, uh, -face, like most of you, or all of you. But I go when it comes to this stuff, I I mm -hmm. have to think twice, and uh, you know, I just want to mention that. Sure. And, and I don't know if we need a policy, uh, Mr. Warden. Do we need a policy mm -hmm. for a hybrid, or is there no. is there such a thing that we have to, or we don't need? I wonder. No hybrid. I I, I think. I think that we that we're allowed to do that because oh, we're, okay. we're 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 allowed to do these. So a hybrid would probably fall under the same. Uh, <clears throat> maybe, uh, say, Muse, you, you were going to say something there. Go ahead. We have a virtual meeting policy, so we'll make sure that that you get a copy of that, reread it, see how relevant it is to you today. No. Um, I see no reason why we can't do hybrid. That would be up to you. We have the video capacity to do that in our council chambers. Thank you. So um, yeah, so we can, we do have that policy. We'll make sure of it. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Donaldson. Yeah, just for an example, uh, we had to cancel our Abuptic Festival planning meeting last night because of members that have COVID. Yeah. And uh, I think the last meeting as much as I like going to in-person meetings but shortly after that meeting it wasn't too many days I was sitting and I've been sitting next to Alan and he tested positive and uh, and I see that some of the stats people with diabetes and it affects, it affects them way more than other people mm -hmm. so I'm not going to be comfortable going to a meetings live meetings until the numbers are substantially lower than what they are now in this in this area and it's hard to find out exact numbers because nobody's reporting on them and there's so many cases that don't get reported so uh until 
there's a better handle on what's going on, I'm going to, I'm going to be sitting right here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we can certainly look at, at a hybrid and those that are comfortable in coming to the, to the office can come to the office and those that are not can at least, you know, uh, and we don't want to have a meeting where people don't feel comfortable coming and they don't show up at the meeting because, you know, we, we want to give everybody a chance to, to, to participate in these meetings. You know, and, and we just don't want to say we're going to meet whether you come or you don't. That, you know what I mean? Like, we don't want that. We want to give everybody the chance and we want every, everybody to be comfortable in attending the meeting, whichever way, whichever way that it is. Okay. Councillor Digden. Uh, thank you. And, and yes, I'm 100% with their agreement with them. There's a meeting later on this week that I'm supposed to be attending. And to be honest with Kuku, you know, it's a not an in-camera meeting and there's gonna be a, quite a few people around it. And I'm debating as to whether or not I'm gonna go to be honest and truthful with you. Um, because of my other job, I can't, uh, I can't afford to get uh, COVID. And big thing is nor would I, not so much. I'm only using the can't afford as I'd hate to get it and then not know it and then end up infecting a funeral home full of people, you know. And the only other thing I was going to mention for the agenda topics for next meeting is maybe the uh, we received a um, letter from a concerned citizen uh, talking about the reduction of physician services down here in the public homes in the Argyles. And I think maybe it's something that we should talk about, maybe pass along to the powers that be or the, the physician navigator or whatever, just to let her know what's going on down here and stuff like that. That's all. Okay. So I'd like to have it added. Sure. Please. I have put it on the doctor recruitment uh, agenda for next week. Thank you. Okay. CAO Mews. I would just say we'd be happy to add that to your council meeting after the doctor recruitment committee gets a chance to look at it because it could be crossing paths. Um, uh, that situation speaks to a medical clinic that's located in the municipality. So it's very appropriate for us to talk about it. But I just think that they get the chance to look at it from a navigation perspective. And then you may actually request them to make a presentation to you, for instance, that might be a choice that you might be moving. All very good. It's just I'd like definitely like to see it brought up. That's all, and some attention directed towards it. Thank you. It's a genuine concern, you know. Yes, it is for for that yes, area where where you know. I mean, that's that's two doctors, right? That they're talking about. That's right. Big time. A lot of a uh, lot of elderly elderly patients. A lot of patients that need doctors on a regular uh schedule and that so yes it's definitely a genuine concern okay okay question period did we get any questions no questions surprising there's no in camera no topics for in camera so i guess next thing is the adjournment Moved by Councillor Sonia, seconded by Councillor Bork. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Thank you, everybody.